Welcome back. It's great to be with you in this second week of Advent. I hope your Advent is going well. I'm Father Michael. I'm Father Luke. This morning we celebrate, well, and just all day, the great feast of St. Nicholas. So we told you last week, I hope you watched, um, and I hope maybe you, some of you did that. You can always share us, uh, share with us, like in the comments or whatever. <laughs> we haven't really gotten, we haven't expanded to comments and that kind of thing. But if you want, feel free to share with us and you know how your St. Nicholas feast day went this morning with your kids. But we told you last week as well that... We celebrate this week the Feast of St. Juan Diego. So on the 9th is the Feast of St. Juan Diego, and very closely connected to him is the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So this Sunday, um, technically the date is Our Our Lady of Guadalupe, but because it's the third Sunday of Advent, we will not be you know celebrating her liturgically as much as, as we would normally, but we are going to have at the Spanish Mass a big Guadalupe you know, feast day. But Father Luke was going to share with you his experience of being uh, with Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. So I hope it's interesting. Yes, <laughs> me too. <laughs> so uh, I was in Mexico City uh, a couple of years ago at this point on a mission trip, and we got to see the image. And just a little backstory, Juan Diego, he was one of the first Christians that were baptized in the Aztec Empire. So he was one of the very few families that were Christian in the very beginning. Uh, the huge boom of Christianity didn't happen until after, about 10 years after Our Lady, Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared. So the fascinating story. So basically he is a indigenous Indian that's going back and forth living with his uncle. And he goes by this hill called Tepeyac Hill, and this woman appears... And it doesn't look like Mary. It actually looks like an Aztec princess. Um, it looks like this girl that is wearing Aztec um, princess garb, and she appears to him and says that you need to build a church on this hill, and you need to tell the bishop. So Juan Diego goes and he tells the bishop, and the bishop says, you know, what are you talking about? This is very, like, kind of different. And so Juan Diego goes back, and, you know, he meets this lady again, this, this princess, and again, she says, you need to go tell the bishop. So he says a second time, and the bishop said, you know, he kind of tried to avoid him. And, you know, he told him again, and the bishop's like, all right, look, you need to, like, give me some sort of sign or something. Um, I can't just build it because you told me to, t- uh, to build it. So Juan Diego's uncle gets sick in the meantime. So he's going during this route, and this lady keeps appearing to him and asking him to build his church. And he's, he's, he's not into it. He needs to do other things. So he goes around a different way. And it's then where she appears again, and she says, look, we really need to build this church, so go up on top of this hill, and you'll find roses. Bring those to the bishop. That'll be your sign. So he fills up these roses, which are happens in December, where they would not bloom. They wouldn't be there, these Castilian roses, and he fills up his tilma, and he brings them to the bishop. And this is like an interesting detail not many people notice. When he goes before the bishop, he lets down all the flowers, and the flowers fall to the ground, and then the image appears. So the image wasn't actually made by the roses, but the image appears after the flowers fall to the ground. Um, the image itself is fascinating. Uh, there's been a lot of different studies on it. Um, there are elements in Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, even NASA has studied this, this tilma, um, and they found elements um, of different you know, paint and things that are not on the periodic table that they don't even know what, 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 what it is. Um, there also, if you take a microscope to the eye, you can actually see images of the bishop and Juan Diego within the eye of Our Lady of Guadalupe, some really fascinating things. Um, the paint itself isn't even on the tilma. It, it kind of like mysteriously hovers like over it. It's, it's a very, uh, you can look all of this up. Um, it's very fascinating. Um, People have tried to sabotage the image. Um, There's been bombs exploded near it, and it was magically or mystically, or I'm sorry, mysteriously, some M words, uh, preserved. Um, I actually met Maria, I'm forgetting her last name in this moment, but she was part of the family that preserved the tilma 
during the Cristero War, when there was a huge persecution on Catholicism, they actually kept it in their family closet, and the bishop and priest would go to visit them. So it was just a fascinating, fascinating image itself um, that has certain qualities that are so mysterious. And um, the tilma itself is made of, when I say tilma, it's made of like a, it's like a, a sack cloth. Most tilmas deteriorate very quickly. Um, this tilma has been, you know, has been able to survive over hundreds of years, I think 450 plus years at this moment. So even that is very hard to explain how the tilma itself hasn't unraveled and deteriorated. Um, so there's so many things uh, that we could say about Our Lady of Guadalupe, but I think the most interesting thing is 10 years after she appeared, 9 million Catholics, a uh, historian at that time recorded 9 million Catholics. So we're talking about millions of conversions. Um, due to the fact of Our Lady of Guadalupe and her influence on the Aztec Empire. Um, just a one other thing that I'd like you to consider um, just going into this feast day on December 12th is a lot of people don't like to say this. Like, they don't like to say that some cultures are better than others. But if you believe, you know, in a certain hierarchy of virtue and also value systems, the Aztec Empire was actually a very brutal society. Culturally, it was a culture of death. Um, they did human sacrifices. And I'm not just talking about a few human sacrifices. During a four-day festival, there were, there were accounts that they would sacrifice up to 80,000 people. 80,000 people in the course of four days. Uh, most estimates put the human sacrifices at 250,000 per year. Um, some historians debate that, you know, whether it was 80,000 at the festival or it was 20,000, but we're talking about tens of thousands of people being slaughtered um, for this, this Aztec religion um, that did human sacrifices. So it's just fascinating to see that Christianity, when it comes with its message, I think this is, this is kind of a, something that I experienced there when you have a cathedral built on top of Aztec ruins. It's almost as if God's saying, you're sacrificing all of these people, your sons, your enemies, he goes, but I have come and I sacrifice my son. You can end your sacrifices. You can end the blood. I give my blood to you. I think this is the beautiful reversal and total inversion um, of the evil that we see in the goodness of our God. So I think it's really beautiful. Even in the sacrifice of the mass, we see God giving his own body, not demanding our bodies, but him giving his. So I think just there's something special about Christianity. We know that it's unique. But it truly is uh, reality. This is, this is what we experience, that God gives himself. Um, he doesn't demand us. So it's really beautiful. Um, just So I hope you really enter into this feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I hope she shows you um, God as he truly is. I think this is something I get really excited about. Yeah, and for good reason. <laughs> um, so one of the things um, with Guadalupe I like to remind people is that she is more so than Pat, well, you know, so Patrick, we acclaim to be a great evangelist. Um, Paul and Timothy and Titus, you know, all the kind of from the or the early the letters of the of the scriptures, um, the the great Jesuits that have existed. So Ignatius and Francis Xavier, the patron of, of missionaries, you know, all of them combined did not meet the same effect that Guadalupe, the or the image of our Our Lady of Guadalupe had on the world. So when you think of that 9 million conversions, um, you know, they were like minuscule to that, even though they did great things. And so, um, you know, just, it's always reminding us, like, as we enter into our work of evangelization, so we are trying to emphasize that right now at, at the parish, and we have the St. Paul, you know, St. Paul Street Evangelization, we have um, the sharing the gift studies we're doing right now. So every Monday, we had it last Monday, and then tonight, and then the next two Mondays, um, this focus on us, you know, what are we called to do to evangelize? And then just always knowing that, you know, when God wants to do something, you know, it's so, always going to be so much more powerful, <laughs> um, but he w invites us into it. So like anytime that we're doing this work of evangelization to never forget, you know, to pray and to, to ask the Holy Spirit, to ask Our Lady um, to be with us as we, and, you know, we try to engage in this mission to evangelize and to bring the good news to those who don't have it. So I hope everybody's doing that. And, um, um, you know, the sacrifice, you know, there was another thing you, you'd mentioned that just reminded me of something else, but maybe you'll have to be next time. If you do get a chance though, to go to Mexico City, um, it really is like a Catholic Disney world. The campus itself, mm -hmm. you have 
the basilica, you have the old basilica, you have Tepayak Hill, which there's another shrine on top. There's a place where there's a well there. Um, it's a really awesome campus, and I really had a really awesome time at our mission trip being able to visit Our Lady of Guadalupe pretty much each day. We would stop by, um, say hello um, to the Lord through, you know, in the church, real presence of the Eucharist, and then see Our Lady of Guadalupe, and then we'd go to the orphanage, or we'd go to the city dump, and then we'd come back and we'd pay our, you know, visits and ask, pray for the people that we had just ministered to. So it was a really neat experience. So I hope you have a, a chance to go to Mexico City. It was really a wonderful wonderful experience. Uh, again, it was like a Catholic Disney world. It was, it was awesome. You spend days there. Yeah. And so like, instead of shooting, like, you know, there's like the buzz light, the buzz light year ride at Disney world. Is yeah. there like a thing like that? No, I don't remember any buzz light year things, but no, it's like Catholic Disney world. <laughs> so yeah, light so candles can, and stuff. You can light candles <laughs> and, and buy rosaries and things like that. But, um, all right. Well, so I guess the thing that sacri- like as far as sacrifice goes, you know, we gather every every day and then every weekend the church calls forth her children to, to celebrate mass together <clears throat> together. Um that's one of the things that Our Lady Guadalupe of of you know did in the past and then now in today's world. Um we kind of I don't know, it's kind of an interesting thing. Like why um are you know any any Catholic you know should be coming to mass and, and people need to know that and it's part part of the church's problem is like we haven't catechized enough I guess we haven't told people you know ch- you know church is not really an option it's like a requirement so every Sunday and every holy day so this Wednesday um, if this comes out I don't know if it com- it'll come out on Wednesday or not but um, is a holy day that we're we're called to go to mass you know we have to just like Sunday go to church um, but just thinking on the past of like how powerful the intercession of Our Lady of Guadalupe was you know we we as christians as people who um are engaged in this this work of the church and to bring the sacraments to people you know we have to continue to to do that you know we and we've seen now um how those nine million people that might have converted and then um that was handed on to their families um you know it doesn't it doesn't last forever so we can think of saint patrick from ireland you know like the whole island of ireland was converted through St. Patrick, supposedly, and, and he did all these great things, and Ireland sent priests, like, all over the world, this awesome, like, beautiful thing that happened, like, where in America and in different parts of the world, um, the, the priesthood was, was uh, you know, supplemented by these Irish priests that um, kept the sacraments going and that, that, you know, fed Americans for years and years and years. We have, I think, still, like, one or two that are actively pastors and, and parishes in our, in our diocese, but... Um, but they're like in their late seventies now, and um, so we have to just remind as we see these big events that have taken place in the past. You know, we're called to continue to participate in those things, and we are the ones who hand on the faith every day. And then, so the fruits from Our Lady of Guadalupe, the fruits from Saint Patrick's ministry in Ireland, we're seeing them not being the same. Like Ireland now, like would they say it's like a. I know they're struggling with like an, an atheistic culture and like church it's dwindling. Yeah, they're receiving missionary priests now instead of sending out priests. They're actually receiving yeah priests. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so in Mexico, we could probably say some very similar things have happened. You know, that where the faith is not as alive as it was like back when this happened um, with with Juan Diego and, and the Tilma of, of Guadalupe, um, and then in America, you know, we've seen. Um, that's what I was going to say about the sacrifices. So like. In Mexico, mm-hmm. the Aztec culture, um, you know, they're sacrificing all these people, you know, 80,000 in an event. Um, we have to re- recognize that we do the same thing in our culture. Like, now it, it's cleaner, it's it's prettier, whatever you want to call it. But um, when we put people to death um, in from the prison systems, and then when we abort, um, you know, the innocent human life in, in the womb um, before concept, before... Um, being carried to full term, you know, those are the ways that our culture is offering these sacrifices, but maybe not as a formal way, maybe not as like this Aztec empire is like, we're going to do this, but we in these other ways are doing the same thing in our culture. So that's why it's it's really, really important that we are praying and fighting for um, the sanctity of human life, the dignity of, of the human person um, through these different ways to fight um, our abortion culture, but then also we can't forget that, you know, we don't believe in, in killing anybody. So even um, the murderer, our, you know, 
people who've struggled and fallen into whatever led them to to where that they might be on death row now because of crimes they've committed um, those same people you know we as Catholics pray for their their freedom and their conversion um, but not th- n- never that we're going to be the the judge that puts them to to death so um, that's what yeah so that's what I was thinking of when he was talk- talking about the sacrifices so I hope that we can find ways to continue to pray for that and, and to understand in our own Catholic identity that um, there's lots of work to do. So there's lots of work for us as Christians to, to continue moving forward with. All right. Well, we're getting close. We've been talking about it for a long time, and now the weekend has come. Yeah, so our, our <clears throat> women's retreat is now um, going to be underway on Friday and Saturday. So just I'd like you to uh, please keep them in prayer. If you can, pray a rosary for... Our ladies, we have 160 um, registered, so I'm very excited about that. We had 40 and then 80, and I thought that was going to be amazing. And then now we have 160, so 150 cap and a little <laughs> lanyap, if I'm saying that right. I got it corrected by our Louisiana folks. I think it's lanyap, lagnap. They say don't say the G, but that's the extra 10 people, so congratulations. Um, I think it's going to be a great weekend. And so please, please uh, keep that in your prayers, even now before you forget, just at least say um, a few prayers um, for all those that are attending, that they could have a profound experience of the Lord during this weekend. Yeah, and a shout out to the husbands. I, I talked about it at different masses throughout these last few months. You know, thank you for making it possible for your your spouse to to be with her beloved. You know, to be with Jesus for that weekend. Um, I know for some families that's really challenging, and you had to do planning and work. You know, to let um, to let them be there. Um, so thank you, husbands, for standing up and, and being great husbands in that way. Um, so we talked about last week that we had some work, some details to kind of iron out with the St. Rita Christmas party, but now that work has been done. So just mark your calendars, December 16th at 5 p.m. We will have our wonderful preschoolers and religious education kids perform for anybody who comes to watch. Of course, they, they'll perform anyway, whether there's nobody there or there's 100 (laughs) people there. Um, you know, they do this little Christmas story of, of the birth of, of the Savior. So, um, so yeah, Thursday, December 16th, 5 p.m. here on our property. Please come, St. Rita Christmas Party. There'll be great food, great great time, great games and things for the kids. And then a couple days before that, I told you last week again, um, I'm involved with the, the other churches locally here at, in South Walton. Um, they're going to be doing a remembrance service at Community Church right across the street from us. Um, from Mole Drive and 98, um, and that'll be on the 14th. So I think it's like at two o'clock in the afternoon. So if you have, if you have lost a loved one this year, um, that's what it's for. It's it's to remember the loved ones we've we've lost this year, but um, in an, in an ecumenical way. So it's not purely Catholic. It's more of something we can join our our other Christian brothers and sisters in praying for the deceased and then offering consolation to those who have lost people that they love they love so all right nice thank you it? everybody thank you for watching and hope you can join us next time hit the like button subscribe then you'll finally be happy if yeah. you and i hope follow you lo- us i hope you like this hat which will become a staple for our our show and for just my life so i'm gonna wear it all the time <laughs> now until all my hair is gone but um thanks for watching uh saint rita media is our page on YouTube, um, St. Rita Parish, Panhilda Padres, please follow us. You'll get all the things we do every day um, very quickly and fast. So, all right. May Almighty God bless you and your families, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.